at long last. A four-part documentary about David Beckham, that retiring, reticent blossom. Since fame, football, posh spice, and numerous million-pound deals made him one of the most paid celebrities on the planet, with 82 million followers on Instagram and a tattooist on speed dial, what in the world has been going on in his life? Someone please solve the mystery of this squeaky-voiced striker, a former Manchester United and England all-star whose journey from Chingford to Kerching Ford is the stuff of folklore with each dramatic moment of his story being chronicled on a blog, a report, or a TV appearance. You could laugh, but on Beckham, Netflix, some intriguing new information does quickly emerge from the sidelines. When we think back to the very beginning of his time at Old Trafford, David is said to have spent his footballer's salary week after week, while more astute teammates, including his future best friend Gary Neville, were busy saving for a rainy day, and had already put money into a pension plan. David was shopping for clothes, Rolex watches, flashy cars and fountain pens in the meantime. Who the hell purchases pens? Roy Keane, a former star for Manchester United, responds with his customary subtlety and elegance. And as always, Roy's studs-up, common-sense outlook on life is hard to argue with. Fisher Stevens, who also does the interviews for the David Beckham series of documentaries, was suggested to David by Leonardo DiCaprio, which may be all the information we want. Fisher offers access and insights, but given that David Beckham's production firm, Studio 99, co-produced the film, how much information are the Beckhams and those in their inner circle really prepared to divulge? Additionally, you don't become one of the richest stars on the planet, without managing your reputation right down to the last bee that falls into the honeypot, which is exactly what happens in the first episode's opening moments. David leaves the grounds of his opulent Cotswolds barn complex in his gold-monogrammed beekeeper's costume, Snort, to gather honey from the hives he set up during lockdown. One inebriated bee falls into his jar when he opens the honey tap. In a different setting, in a different planet, some poor footballers have sued for less. Nothing except natural wholesomeness exists here. Beckham gently corrects the falling bee. Oh, God, really? Fisher is able to tell David that his other pastime is Lego, and that his wife Victoria prefers the name DB's Sticky Stuff, even if David wants to call his honey Golden Bees. Is that delightful or repulsive, revealing or disgusting? You inform me. The two episodes of Beckham that were made available to journalists for preview do not touch on any of the controversial topics that continue to surround David and his family, such as his alleged extramarital affairs in the past, his debatable choice to represent Qatar at the 2022 World Cup despite the nation's violations of human rights, or the £66 million debt that hangs over Victoria's baffling fashion empire. Not to mention the latest rumours about Brooklyn, the oldest son, getting married to Nicola Peltz, the daughter of a billionaire, or his purported hissy fit about his continued lack of a knighthood. Perhaps episodes three and four will cover everything. Keep your breath in check. What we do understand is that David Beckham's life is like a football game. It has its ups and downs. What transpired on the field during England's 1998 World Cup encounter against Argentina has split his existence as a football player, a celebrity, a spouse, a parent, and a man. The England striker, who had, to be fair, been fouled fairly spectacularly by an Argentinian defender, snapped in a fit of rage and struck out with his boot. David received a red card, which made his humiliation much worse because England ultimately lost the game on penalties. But that was just the start. The subsequent response was explosive. If it's hard to tell the difference between a football fan with a grudge and a murderous psychopath, then this occurrence increased the level of hatred among enraged supporters' desire for retribution. Afterward, Beckham was demonized on the terraces and in the streets for months, if not years. 
his effigy was hung from a pole by someone. Fans began hurling insults at his family as well as posh spice at every game she attended. Victoria says she found it embarrassing and hurtful as she sits in the front parlour of their £31 million Holland Park mansion with her hair in a mum bun. These facts, however, are not brand new. She was told not to worry about it by her dear friend Elton John, who was subjected to the same insults during Watford FC games. The intriguing thing about David is how often he butts heads with the male authority figures in his life, his father, Alex Ferguson, and England team manager Glenn Hoddle, while the mollycoddled ladies in his life are always eager to defend him. Sandra, his mother, believes that Ted, his father, was too harsh on him and also accuses Hoddle of putting her adored son under the bus. After the World Cup event, his wife Victoria claimed that he was clinically depressed. But how was she to know? Clinical depression can only be diagnosed by a doctor, psychiatrist or mental health specialist. But at the time, mental health was a grey area and David Beckham was left to fend for himself. Here, he is portrayed as a victim who, without assistance from anybody else, found the inner fortitude and courage to go through it. Although this is undeniably true in some fundamental ways, there is little recognition that being an international football player comes with a price that must be paid in addition to the cars, clothes, pens, glory and fantastic money. Keeping discipline on the football field is the least of those. Everyone keeps talking about how awful it was, but no one says what cannot be said, that David was to blame and brought it all on himself. In fact, there is a startling lack of understanding from all the key players, despite the luxury of hindsight and the opportunity for everyone engaged to reflect on what transpired. Victoria contacts him from the United States, where she was on tour with the Spice Girls, just before the greatest game of his life, to inform him that she is expecting their first child. If she had believed that would be helpful to him, Fisher asks her. She shrugs her shoulders and says, I don't really know. You cannot help but share Alex Ferguson's concerns that Victoria would divert David's attention from his football. His mother claimed they just blamed him after that. According to David, it was a massive game for me. He tells this while at home in the Cotswolds, wrapped in cashmere, looking as good as ever, and exuding a droll gentleness that undoubtedly conceals the fortitude he must have had to get through it all. He admits, I made a mistake. Then, as he recalls the first time he was paid for a brile cream commercial, a broad golden grin appears on his face, spreading like honey.